and then we will go to our next speaker. Uh, we will go to a second target field lab project with open space, open source software to visualize the universe with interactive research data. And the University of Groningen and Target Field Lab also work with the Open Space Project in cooperation with the Hayden Planetarium in New York and the University of Neuköping in Sweden. And our speaker about open space will be Carter Emmert. He is director of astrovisualization at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, to Carter, to keep an eye on the time, I will give you a notice when you have five minutes left. We start a little bit later, I will take that into account. And I will first give the word to Professor Anders Ineman to give an introduction. Is Anders there? Is Anders there? Hmm. Let's see, Ries, do you see Anders? Oh, there we are. Okay. All right. Okay, now I cannot hear you, but that's a different thing though. Let's see. I can hear you, Anders. Okay, now we're probably on. You, you did not promote me, I guess. All right, great. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be uh, the person to introduce my, my dear friend, uh, Carter Emmert now. Uh, Carter is the, um, uh, the director of uh, astrovisualization at the Hayden Planetarium in New York and, and at the American Museum of Natural History. And um, Carter has an extremely uh, long list of achievements and, uh, and I will try to highlight some of the things from my own perspective of, of, of his uh, amazing career. He, he really has an undergraduate degree in uh, geophysics from the University of Colorado. And as many of you know, he has since then been involved in a large number of visualization and technical illustration work in, in space exploration and in astronomy. Uh, he has worked at NASA Ames. He has worked at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, before he was joining AMNH. Now, he's also very well known for his directorship of a large number of space shows coming out of AMNH and the Hayden Planetarium including some amazing shows like Journey to the Stars, Passport to the Universe, and the most recent one, Worlds Beyond Earth, uh, which has an enormous impact in the planetarium community. He is certainly one of the pioneers in astrovisualization in combination with public outreach. And, uh, and in view of this, he was honored with uh, uh, an honorary PhD uh, degree from the University of Linköping in 2006. And also in 2016, he received the most prestigious award in the planetarium community, uh, the Technology and Innovation Award. Uh, I met Carter for the first time in, in 2001 uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the SIGGRAPH conference in Los Angeles. And, and at that point, we started to chat about the possibility to not only produce movies and videos uh, of space and, and for science communication, but also to interactively visualize a, a large range of astronomical content uh, and do that in a consistent way. Do it in a sort of a browser of the universe way. And this discussion was the beginning of a very long and still ongoing uh, collaboration that has led to a large number of student exchange projects, meetings, also to the software Uniview that some of you may have seen in planetariums all over the world. But in 2015, uh, we also initiated the work on well, we wanted to be uh, an open source project uh, to further distribute and reach the impact uh, beyond the planetarium uh, with interactive visualization in the astronomy domain. This project has now turned into one of the most advanced or perhaps the most advanced astro visualization software package in the world. And the development is still ongoing with support from NASA and a large number of partners all over the world. So I am very pleased to Welcome Carter to give his talk. And his talk is entitled Evolution of Planetarium Theatres from Sky Demonstrations to Immersive 3D Science Description and Investigation. Thank you, Carter. Thank you, Anders. Uh, well, wow. it's, it's an honor to be speaking to you all today and, um, and to be introduced by my good friend Anders. Um, and uh, 
and also the range of uh, topics and, and astronomical um, uh, content here, Eric and Wendy. Wow, <laughs> fantastic talks. Um, so uh, to talk about open space, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna share my screen and just take us through a few things. I really wanna sort of focus on open space um, and what, what that uh, entails and where it's going, uh, but leave room for some questions. So um, I have a lot to cover, so I'll, I'll just, I'm gonna share my overall screen here and uh, pardon if, uh, um, if it seems a little messy. <laughs> So um, I hail from uh, the Rose Center for uh, Earth and Space, where uh, um, uh, to, if you're old enough, uh, you may remember the old Hayden Planetarium and, um, and what that, that looked like. And it was replaced uh, as a Millennium Project uh, with uh, the, Hayden, the new Hayden Planetarium inside the sphere in the upper portion of the, uh, of the sphere at the, uh, uh, at the Museum of Natural History. Um, and um, we have the various exhibits uh, showing the scale of the universe and, and uh, um, in the center uh, portion here is, is uh, a timeline of, of the universe. Uh, the, the lower portion of the sphere is a, is, is a, a big bang recreation. Uh, we used uh, the visualization um, from UniView, which uh, Anders mentioned um, some years back, um, featuring our digital universe. Um, I wanted to talk about this um, first. Uh, this digital universe um, concept came about through um, the rebuild of the old Hayden Planetarium um, to, to the new. And um, our illustrious uh, director, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, like to frame it in a nice way, uh, I still like to, to quote this, is that um, what would the planetarium of the 21st century be? Um, of course, uh, the planetarium uh, in its projection form was developed uh, by Zeiss, and I'll just, uh, um, just go to this image here. Um, and uh, this, this is an image of the old uh, Zeiss Mark I projector. Um, uh, built in Jena, uh, Germany, and uh, projecting, um, and uh, to be quite honest, uh, from this, this figure, I'm not exactly sure which city it's in, um, but typically you see, you see the audience highlighted, uh, but you can see the constellation of Orion in the sky, um, and you can um, also see a kind of hallmark of planetariums uh, um, in this uh, uh, beginning in, in uh, the, the first planetarium that was built in Vienna, Germany in 1926. Uh, that uh, three years earlier, it had been sort of a demonstration on the top of the, the Zeiss factory in Vienna. And, um, but planetariums evolved and, and every, every city uh, had to have one. Uh, the first one in America was uh, in Chicago at the Adler Planetarium um, in 1930. In 1935, the Hayden Planetarium opened up in New York. And typically they had a, um, a uh, skyline um, that uh, our original one, I, I understand there's still pieces of it out in a, a warehouse in Brooklyn, which I have not seen, but part, parts of this original cutout uh, of metal uh, <laughs> to create the New York skyline. And, um, <clears throat> but the fantastical diurnal motions of the night sky uh, and also independent projectors for, for uh, uh, the planets and, and sun and moon uh, accompanied this mechanical optical um, uh, tribute uh, in a way to the industrial revolution and in ways um, that uh, this this strange uh, creature in the middle of the room was always kind of a feature of going to the planetarium and uh, for the imagination certainly of children uh, and, and uh, we had this ice mark six when I, I started taking classes at the Hayden when I was 10 years old um, but the motions along this major axis of a sort of dumbbell shape is uh, mimics that of the uh, sky and is, is very similar to an equatorial mounted telescope. Um, and um, uh, uh, presentation mode here, I'm sorry that uh, I was gonna show a few more slides, but suffice to say that uh, at this time, the industrial revolution making uh, the ability to have bigger and bigger telescopes, and then finally these, these optical mechanical devices in the early 20th century. 
led can to. You, uh, can I ask you a question, Carter? Can please, you please. can you also uh, make the screen uh, larger so that it fills the screen? It might yeah, be yeah, I, and uh, my, my my apologies on that. Um, also, uh, my ability to just um, I, I thought this presentation would, would work and it's in Dropbox, and it's it's not. I, I just wanted to really sort of make this point about these optical mechanical devices um, and telescopes and the mechanization essentially of astronomy and then the presentation of astronomy to the public uh, was, was uh, fantastic. Um, this educational device was so popular that sort of all cities around the world began to uh, develop these um, and not just the Zeiss machines, uh, Goto in Japan started making them, uh, the Spitz, uh, um, company in the United States started making their version. So there, there, was, there were different um, types of these and they presented an accurate data visualization of the night sky. That, that depiction that you see in the background of Orion is accurate insofar as a sky map that was very uh, accurately presented and uh, can be controlled for the diurnal motion of, of the night sky, the seasonal motion. And also the tilt of this axis of, of the central beast in the room could uh, be adjusted to show the entire uh, sky. In fact, one of uh, the uh, uh, spheres we see here, the one facing us is the northern sky and the, the one in the background is the southern sky. So this has the ability to sort of project on a hemisphere, uh, depending on its tilt, so the entire three, uh, 360 view of the night sky. So what was this, uh, uh, you know, the, this, what was happening in technology, uh, essentially, and I'll, I'll just uh, bring this smaller, um, I wanted to invoke another slide I had here, um, of uh, what was happening in the um, technology areas of, uh, I'll just try to make this a little bigger, um, is uh, that uh, in, Neil deGrasse Tyson sort of phrases this question, um, but in the early 90s, the Museum of Natural History, before it committed to modernizing the Hayden Planetarium, it had modernized the dinosaur halls. And um, so in that, in the rethinking of, uh, of uh, the dinosaurs uh, were actually hot-blooded and, and bird-like uh, was, was a major difference. And um, so that renovation was, uh, was enormous. And so the time it, it was seen, this trend in technology and immersive uh, technology uh, was really the trend of uh, starting in the 1980s of the first digital planetariums with the uh, Evans and Sutherland company. But we teamed up here with uh, our National Center for Supercomputing Applications that were doing um, uh, they had developed uh, the uh, electronic uh, visualization lab part of the University of Illinois had developed the CAVE or Computer Assisted Virtual Environment. And um, what you see depicted on this image is actually something um, in the early 90s. It was very exciting, which was the linking up of multiple sites. Um, the, Bob Patterson in the upper right is actually standing in the CAVE, and uh, which uh, you just sort of see him in front of the screen, but then Donna Cox is uh, over on the left, and below her is Stuart Levy. And this team of uh, Donna, Bob, and, and Stuart had sort of created this technology, and they were also linked up to the Chesapeake Bay Project, a number of these uh, large visualization centers, all in the same data set. And so this is very exciting. And what could we do with this for, um, for uh, astronomy, essentially? And uh, they had worked with a number of astronomers. Um, let me just reduce this and I'll get rid of this um, slide. And um, that uh, I'll talk about that later. So um, I'm just going to enlarge um, open space here and uh, show you that uh, we're now in this digital realm. So the big difference between the planetarium uh, <laughs> of our grandparents, let's say, uh, was that ability to see the sky and all the attendant motions. Uh, we could certainly do that digitally, but we had gained a tremendous amount of information thanks to, again, the Industrial Revolution, larger telescopes, 
but also the computing revolution that completely uh, made us immersed in data and an understanding of the universe more and more three-dimensionally. And so using three-dimensional data visualization to really show that. So here I, I show you the constellations, both in stick figures, the star to star connection. <clears throat> we see the zodiac, we see um, I, right here, I, I show uh, Scorpius and then we see Sagittarius, the archer's arrow pointing toward the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This is right, a section of the Milky Way and that we can pan about. I'm in open space now. I'm going to pan around to something else that's in open space with us right now. And that's the International Space Station and we're above the earth. And uh, so uh, we're in this and, and I'm gonna move around the uh, space station. Um, and uh, I have my controls. I thought about how I should present this today. Um, usually we present without the controls, but I'm just going to bring up uh, my, my menus and, and why not show you. So I'm centered on the ISS and a pull around, but there's also a clock here and the clock is not moving. So what I want to do is go to, um, I want to make sure that I go to one, let's go to one second per second. Uh, let's go down. Oh. Okay, oops, let me just enter this one second per second. I'm going to hit the, um, <laughs> the start button, and uh, you can see how slowly the uh, International Space Station orbits the Earth. Um, <laughs> slow, I, I'm making a joke really because you know the, the International Space Station travels at 17,500, pardon me, miles per hour. Um, <laughs> I don't have my, uh, I don't know what that is in kilometers off of my head, sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, it goes around the earth in an hour and a half. You may have noticed uh, as well that uh, this image, I'm, um, <laughs> this is an, an amazing to me now even that, that uh, I can be on a Zoom call to you all. But at the same time that I am gathering the data of the earth, this is an image of yesterday. And it goes down to 500 meter resolution. And uh, we're approaching uh, Portugal and Spain. Um, if I zoom over here, oh, there we see North Africa and we can see um, Gibraltar and uh, the Mediterranean. And um, also you may notice that uh, this, the, uh, as far as the atmosphere, so this image, this image is gathered, what we're doing is we're streaming data sets um, from, uh, we, we don't want to hold all the data here, so we're actually using the web uh, map streaming protocols to our colleagues at NASA Goddard and um, Goddard Space Flight Center um, and, uh, in Maryland. And uh, so we're gathering this uh, uh, satellite data and, and displaying that. It's underneath an atmosphere, with, which is a physics-based atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is scary thin, um, <laughs> according to the astronauts. Uh, here we are, we're 400 kilometers off the Earth, um, and arguably the, where the sky goes to black in the trail off of the atmosphere above the Earth is about 30 kilometers or 20 miles. Um, we're between Spain and France. What I love about this um, is that we don't see any borders. Um, the borders are what we impose, um, but uh, we could show borders and all that. Um, I can fly in closer to Earth and fly around it like a Google Earth experience. Um, but there's a lot of ground to cover. So I'm not going to waste any uh, further time on this. I'm just going to bring up my, um, uh, my menu here. I'm just going to turn on the ISS trail. And uh, so then we're going to pull back away. I'm uh, pulling my right mouse button toward me. So it moves me out away from the earth. And here we begin to see what I, what I, think of as this in this data display engine of open space is we have this complete interactivity, but we can show we were just moments ago at the space station. I could have told you all in, in gory detail about this, that, and the other part of the, of the space station. But here we are, and we're looking at, at the orbit. And the orbit is, you know, is 400 kilometers off the Earth. I mean, it's, it's uh, well, we show this um, to audiences. Uh, I mean, people generally don't know how high the space station is. And so here we show that. I'm keeping the zodiacal constellations on. I'm zooming around the earth pretty quickly. We actually come around, we can see the night lights on earth as well. 
Um, I could call up any particular day back to 2000 of this image of the Earth. Um, this one in particular has no gaps. If we go back beyond uh, about 2008, we see images that have gaps in it, but still um, we have this um, tremendous database to go through and look at Earth. And we can also look at many different uh, uh, spectral um, uh, sensitivities and maps that are collected uh, by the NASA Gibbs team. So let me move out here a little farther. I'm gonna bring my menu back and just uh, come up here and say satellites. Whoops, let me just go back. Um, let, let me just do this. Um, focus, Milky Way, solar system. You can see we have many, many things here. Satellites, I want to turn on the geosynchronous satellites. Um, when I do this, I'm going to speed up time here a little bit. Um, so let's go to a, uh, so I'm centered on the space station. Um, that's going to make me zoom around. So I'm going to just uh, focus on Earth here. And um, I'm just going to amplify time a little bit. As I do, I'll get rid of uh, the menus again. And we can see that um, even under ca uh, casual inspection, you, you can see how the, um, the space station uh, goes around the Earth in an hour and a half. <clears throat> but the geosynchronous satellites out of 30,000 kilometers are going to go around the same um, uh, rate of rotation of Earth. So they're going to hover above those spots. And in this case, we can illustrate that 30,000 kilometers is one tenth the distance to the moon. So if I come out here, I'm going to now turn on trails. We saw trails of satellites, but now uh, we, we see trails of the planets around the sun. And also uh, we have the moon. Now the moon's orbit is a little dim. So let me come in here. And I'm going to, where is, uh, so one little, come down here, moon. And I'm going to come down to moon trail. And I'll open that up. I'll get rid of some of these other things. And um, appearance. No. Transparency. Okay, whoops. Uh, appearance. And let's just brighten that up. Okay, so now we see we see the moon. And uh, that's fine. And, uh, and then uh, farther out, here's Orion in the, in the sky. We saw that in the planetarium sky and our zodiac. Now, what is the zodiac? Of course, the sun seems to move through these constellations as we go around the sun. So if I just bring this back up, I'll, my time, I'm gonna go from seconds into hours and uh, I'll speed this up. So now we see as we, well, it's maybe a little fast. Okay, I'll we'll bring this a little slower. And, uh, so now we see the satellites buzzing around the Earth uh, once a day. We see the moon going around the Earth once a month or a month. And we can see as we go around the sun, we're centered on the Earth. Uh, and the sun seems to go around the Earth in the sky. Well, of course, um, Ptolemy had a, a, a sophisticated interpretation of that. Everything went around the Earth, uh, but Copernicus made a simpler interpretation of that of us going around the sun. At this point, um, to move farther out into the data sets um, of the universe, what I'd like to do, I'm just going to center on the sun. Um, so that's our, our center. And we can see now that the zodiac has nothing to do with the alignment of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way, if I was to level that and make that our new horizon, well, that would make sense if I start to pull away from the sun. Now, <clears throat> we've uh, can, I, I left on the, uh, zodiac, uh, the zodiacal artwork as, as well as uh, the constellations. I'm going to just move over uh, to this location for a second. And uh, we can see uh, the Southern Cross and we can see the brightest star uh, in Centaurus here, Alpha Centauri, and we know is a nearest star to us, what I'm doing is setting up for essentially um, the, uh, you know, jump beyond into, uh, in, into uh, this, this ability. We started out with Earth and an intimacy of detail at the uh, International Space Station, but we are going through uh, what open space has is called this, this dynamic scene graph that allows us to actually move through scale and, uh, and do that accurately. And uh, which, is, which is a tremendous thing. If, if I just was to come back for a moment, not all the way to the earth, 
But just point out um, light travel time. If I say that Alpha Centauri is four light years away, well, the sun is eight minutes away in light travel time. Neptune is four hours away. And so if you, you think of, uh, you know, a you know, 24 hour a day, well, if, if uh, the radius of Neptune's orbit is four hours or the diameter is eight hours, you get three solar systems and put them together, that's one light day. And uh, so now I'm gonna move out will brighten the sun um, so that now we see the sun the same brightness as the other stars. And as we do, if I move back and forth, you can see there's a sort of parallax of Alpha Centauri coming off the wallpaper of the stars, if you will. And then I'll pull back even farther. And uh, that's four light years. You notice the artwork, uh, we, we've sort of placed that at, uh, at about 10 um, light years or so. And um, that we have the nearby stars. Uh, this is um, Sirius over on the right, and Procyon. So Sirius is about 10 light years away, Procyon is about 12. And uh, some other stars over here, uh, what we see, um, we have uh, Vega, which is about 20 light years away up here, and 16 light years away, um, Altair. Over here, uh, I'm, a uh, yellowish star, Arcturus, and the star Murfred in uh, the constellation Bootes. And um, so you, you get the point. We're out here in uh, the sort of 3D space now of the constellations. If it's a little hard to see, let me just come up here and readjust that for us. Solar system, Milky Way, I'll go back to my constellations. And um, let me just uh, increase their line width. Um, Transparency, there we go. So we can now see the constellations as three-dimensional um, sort of star-to-star -star connection. And we get out here and uh, we have the, the uh, Milky Way band, which is still, um, so what is the Milky Way? So the, we thought they were sort of clouds, a silver road, the, the, different, the different cultures calling it different things, but some version of milk, a river. And it wasn't until Galileo, who was the first telescope and making note of what he saw in telescopes, thus science, um, it said they're uncountable stars. And um, so that began this notion that, okay, th these are stars beyond those that we can see with our naked eye. Well, how far out does that go? Well, how far out are we right now? So what I'd like to do is just come in here and uh, I'm going to grab um, uh, one other thing here is, oh, let's see, uh -huh. close up some of this, let's open up here, and I'm going to turn on something, this concept of the radio sphere. How far away have our radio signals reached since the Earth became um, radio bright? How am I doing for time? Okay, I'm just looking at my time. So here we have... Um, here we have um, a sphere which is oriented in that of um, it's uh, oriented to that of the Earth. Um, so this would be the North Celestial Pole and South Celestial Pole. Um, but we've given this a radius of 80 light years. So this represents around the time 80 years ago when the Earth became radio bright, it became the brightest radio source, blasting others or uh, radio waves in the solar system. So any of the stars within here have heard from us. Anything beyond that uh, have, yeah, this is expanding at the speed of light, um, but any stars beyond this have not heard from us yet. So in a sense of looking for ET out there, extraterrestrials. Um, you might also wonder, well, we've also discovered stars that, that have uh, systems of their own, the exoplanetary systems. I'll open up the Milky Way here, I'll come down and close up my constellations, but I'll come down here and um, uh, turn on a couple things that, that I want to show. This digital universe concept was developed so that we would have three-dimensional data sets in which to really explore in the planetarium of the 21st century. And so our space show productions, the foundation is this digital universe. And when Anders and I started talking, we developed first UniView and then later Open Space, is this, this desire to really show the universe in this way um, of all these three-dimensional uh, data sets. 
way beyond the constellations here. This is the unfamiliar sky. So let me just come down and uh, close up a few things. I'll open up my exoplanet choices. And I have two. I have these are the ones that have been found dynamically, and you can see a tremendous number of them are within our radio sphere and uh, even more beyond. Uh, we also have the Kepler um, the candidates that are out in one direction that shows that patch of sky where Kepler was staring and found this plethora of, of exoplanets or candidates. My point in showing this is that, is that we now think of stars as having planets. Revolution has, has taken place since the first one discovered in 1995. I'll turn those off. I just want to turn on, say, globular clusters. Globular clusters had a lot to do with our understanding of where we were in this Milky Way galaxy. There we see the Milky Way be, uh, beyond the radiosphere. Lots of globular clusters off where the Milky Way is bright. Let's turn 180 degrees, no globular clusters. So uh, there are various data sets that we can turn on. Uh, let's see. I'll turn on uh, OB associations. These are where bright stars are. And so here we see these, these particular bright star associations. These are all parts of this digital universe. Now, let's move out beyond this. Okay, so that's our portion of the galaxy. We are now starting to see a galaxy that's being revealed to us as I pull out farther, but in, um, in coordination, in context with all this other data. The globular star clusters are the pentagons, and then the bright star associations we see really just close to us in our part of the Milky Way galaxy. And so <clears throat> this um, volumetric model of the Milky Way that we see is not artwork. It's actually the result of a constrained simulation from our colleagues at the National uh, um, Observatory in Japan. And uh, Baba, Wada, and Saito are, are the authors of this. And we uh, contacted them, worked with them as a data source for visualizing uh, the Milky Way galaxy for our spaceships. And we've taken that and uh, we've given that over. Eric Sundin uh, uh, worked uh, at Linshipping on, on actually uh, putting uh, this particular model in. And uh, so this collaboration, open space is, I, I didn't even really introduce it properly, but open space is NASA supported. So it's, it's open source, that's its name. But it's this collaboration with uh, Lynn Shipping University and, and Anders team uh, that uh, extends back you know, about 20 years. And, um, but uh, also the, the, the form of the, the NASA grant that we got um, has enabled us to also work with uh, um, collaborators that Anders has been working with for years. The so University of Utah, the Scientific uh, Computing and Imaging Institute, as well as uh, the New York University's Canton School of Engineering. So our developers um, are at, at these four locations at AM&H, Linshipping University um, in Utah and, and uh, New York University. And uh, so that we make this freely available to the world. So beyond the Milky Way, what's out here? Let's go. Um, I'm gonna pull out just uh, far enough here uh, with the Milky Way sometimes, let me see, Milky Way volume, I'll open that up. Sometimes the star component makes me stutter a little bit, but there's a lot of data in here. Um, as we pull out, this is the Milky Way, our home, but um, our nearest, compa uh, nearest companions essentially are the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds. The nearest big galaxy to us is Andromeda. And if I pull back far enough, I, I should be able to see Andromeda. I'm sorry if it's stuttering a little bit. That's because I have the names turned on. And we've now stepped out into the extragalactic realm. And uh, we're moving exponentially, of course, as we pull out. I'm going taking bigger and bigger steps. And it would take forever to get across the universe if I didn't. So as I pull, pull back, we now see um, the local group. And uh, we're immersed in Brent Tully's um, atlasing of the uh, galaxies nearest to us out to um, a few hundred million light years. And so we're in the center, just as we lost the Earth and lost the Sun, we're now <laughs> losing the Milky Way galaxy immersed in these. And we see out here about 60 million light years away is, uh, is, is the group of, of galaxies about a thousand strong, the biggest sort of downtown of galaxies near us. 
that aligns with uh, way back home with the constellation Virgo. And uh, so, but if I come in close, we'll see, yes, it's all data. This is, these are all positions and, and 3D that we've put in. There are about 30,000 galaxies in this. And if I pull back far enough, now these, these are nice because they surround us, but if I, I'm doing this transition now into the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and I'm gonna let this uh, spin around just a little bit for us. You might wonder, the people always wonder why is, you know, why is the universe shaped like a butterfly? And it's like, we've talked about light years, he's talking too fast. And, you know, suddenly we're out here amongst all these galaxies. The dark areas align with our Milky Way galaxy. And so that makes it difficult for us to pick out all these, these very distant, very dim little galaxies. Also, this Sloan survey was from Apache Point, New Mexico in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have a Northern Hemisphere bias. And so you know, the Southern Hemisphere, we have other data sets that we could show, but I want to sort of pull out even farther. We see the large scale structure of the universe there. We also see something coming off to the bottom. I'll talk about that in a second. But if we pull out far enough, we're now going to see the quasar components of, of the uh, Sloan survey. And so with them, we, are, um, we do not really have enough to really visibly see the large scale structures such as we see in closer. In other words, the, the, uh, um, the galaxy clusters, super clusters in voids, uh, giving us this frothy nature of, of, uh, of the galaxy distribution that we see. And then far enough, if I go far enough out into the, into the quasars, well, we start to fade up the uh, Planck view of the, um, of the cosmic background radiation. Now, we're using a Hubble constant of uh, about 70. And so this, this model out here now, we're out into look back time. I guess the radius of our, of our CMB is out about 42 billion light years of that Hubble constant and all this. Well, what is this line that uh, is suddenly appearing? Um, this is shared to us uh, from our colleagues at, uh, at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. This is the Hubble Deep Field. And uh, so an area that is sort of uh, smaller than what we you know, see visibly on the sky of, of like the full moon. But this reaches out, and I like to come around here like this, that this represents, of course, um, the sort of farthest uh, we can see. In fact, if I pull out far enough, well, then we see our cosmic uh, horizon in, in time, essentially, and how far out to, to, to where, where we can see. Um, and But if I pull inside here, then we can see that that Hubble deep field, uh, in fact, what I can do is uh, just come up in my settings. I'm going to come up in my, uh, I'm going to widen my field of view for you all. And when I do, that should allow us to at least see that the Hubble Deep Field is sort of blowing past all the quasars and all that, as you would expect, because it's, it's our deepest sounding of the universe. Now, what does this line mean? This means, this is what we see with one survey, the Sloan survey. But of course, the Hubble Deep Field <laughs> indicates that this is, this is sort of what we'd see all around us, thus filling in, you know, if we could do a Hubble Deep Field everywhere, it would be uh, tremendous. Um, but this, this <clears throat> illustrates this view of, of uh, this discretization has to do with actually a movie that was made for 3D by the Space Science, tel uh, space science uh, but the, <laughs> I'm sorry the um, Space Telescope Science Institute, our colleagues there. And so I'm gonna just come on back, come on back down. Now this is a fairly was designed to really focus on, um, on oh, uh, is this my, Internet connection is a little unstable. I hope you are all still hearing me. Okay. Um, but open space was really designed uh, to do um, show dynamic simulations. Um, also planetary data uh, coming in very close. Uh, maybe I'll just show you a little bit of that. I'm, 
Um, and uh, once again, I just look at my time here. I know that we're, we're, we're getting um, long, um, but um, uh, let me just um, do the following for a second. I'd like to refocus on Mars and um, just a slight deviation of, from where we were. And uh, also, I, I, at this point, I'd love to just sort of take the time and turn off lots of things on the screen, but I'm going to leave them on um, just in, in the sense of time. And uh, come up on Mars, uh, another world uh, with an atmosphere. Um, notice how the uh, uh, data set, uh, the, the global data set is loading. Oh, there's Valles Marineris uh, nicely showing. That's the gaff across the screen that we see. And um, this is a uh, global data set uh, basically for color. And um, so what I want to do is just come up here and say Mars. And uh, what do you mean nothing found? OK, hold on. Uh, oh, I was in settings. Let me come back into here to Mars. There we go, Mars. And yeah, I'll bring up my layers, color layers. Um, and I'm uh, just going to turn on a, uh, um, a view of Mars that was put together um, thanks to our Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiters and uh, being at Mars for over 10 years, 50,000 orbits, uh, over 50,000 orbits um, contributing to this, this global mosaic that goes down um, to um, five meters in resolution. And we can go even higher than that. I'm just going to come in close, like so. And uh, that uh, we're reading the uh, global elevation as well. And um, then finally, let me just come down here and uh, turn on a higher resolution uh, data set for us. And um, you'll notice a tremendous amounts of data in uh, just even navigate within here, oh, let's see, I'm going to turn on a better height map, and um, I'm just going to come down and turn on, great. So what you see is loading, it's jumping around a little bit as, as we load. Um, this data is located on our server. Um, uh, it, what surrounds is located on our server uh, in Utah. And then what I'm coming into is another server, thanks to our collaboration with Esri. Um, and uh, so uh, they also supply us uh, a beautiful Earth image, which is commensurate in many ways to sort of the detail effect that you, you, uh, level that you can get uh, with Google Earth. So with this, we actually come down on an image that's 25 centimeters in resolution. A lot of the, um, I, I, have, I have high school students um, who actually prepare um, a lot of the uh, elevation maps from stereo using a free process uh, from NASA Ames Research Center. And, um, but these maps that we're seeing in here were um, these elevation maps are derived from stereo Im imagery uh, by the team, uh, Al McEwen, who's a principal investigator, his team at uh, the University of Arizona, ba basically his army of graduate students that come in in their first year, they do penance work by actually creating tons of these maps. So um, that's about uh, what I have to show in open space. Uh, I might take a question or two if there's any time left. And, uh, um, but I'll also try to bring up one last thing uh, to show you as far as dynamics of something that we're working on for a presentation tomorrow, in fact. So I'll just minimize this a little and try to bring that up. Oh, uh, Dagstuhl, um, oh, there, was, <laughs> there were two more things I wanted to show. And so I, my, my apologies. Um, last year, Anders uh, pulled together this team, uh, this group um, at uh, Dagstuhl uh, in Germany, uh, where we went over what the sort of future of this could be with this interaction and bringing data in. And um, so I did have a, a quick little video I would like to show. So if I bring that up and uh, pardon my um, screen navigation here, you probably, it's probably very annoying for all of you, but anyway. Um, let me just come down to uh, this one, turn this on, and I'm going to silence my colleague, Jackie Faherty, um, good friend. But this illustrates where we're going with this is uh, data interoperability and using this tool called Glue. It's a Python library that actually 
glues together a lot of different professional um, astronomical software. So we're looking at a workflow here um, that Jackie is showing. Let's see. Okay. And she's just um, selecting um, the data that, oh, wow. Where did this, um, I don't want to download it. I want to play it. Uh, let me try it again. Where open page? Okay. I'm going to silence her. And I want to enlarge this. Let me try that again. And um, so what this enables is astronomers to use the tools they are familiar with. And then that, uh, uh, they, these, this interoperability with the different tools that they use, um, we're actually bringing open space as just another tool into this. Okay, it's, it's, it's uh, um, not playing. Um, my apologies on that, it did. I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm stressed on just the amount of internet uh, traffic I can hold right now. So I'll take a question and uh, I'll try to load uh, one of the last things here. Um, so. Thank you, Carter, for this uh, very uh, fascinating journey and all the information about this beautiful program. Um, let's see if there are any questions. If you have a question, please note the button on the bottom of your screen, uh, raise a hand. And then I can give you the word. In the meantime, I can probably maybe start with a question of my own. Um, so you are developing, developing all kinds of new materials for open space. What are the main things at the moment that you are working on? Uh, well, what we, what we are working on right now in the pandemic is actually using open space as a kind of flagship for the museum being closed. Um, and um, so we've been doing these, these live programs. Uh, let me just see if I can um, bring this up. Um, oh boy. Um, I, I just wanted to, I want, I want to show um, some, uh, <laughs> let me go to my downloads folder. <laughs> Pardon me for this. Um, and, so what we have been uh, working with, um, let's see. It, yes, okay, good. This is what I wanted to show. This is, um, now we've been working with, since the beginning of Open Space, with NASA Goddard uh, on their Community Coordinated Modeling Center um, for, and I'll just uh, replay this. this. This is what we're going to be showing live and represents the latest work uh, in open space. We have, to, and, and, and how open space really has been developed by a series of lens shipping uh, masters uh, uh, students. So this is their thesis project. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, Emily Ho and Christian Adamson have been working as a team to visualize a simulation um, that, uh, that NASA has been sort of involved with. But this is actually our National Science Foundation um, working with modeling the, uh, um, the sun. And I think I have another movie if I just escape out of this for a second um, and get out of that. And um, let me show this other one. Oh boy, uh, this, okay, yeah, actually this one's good too. Oops, hit the wrong button. And uh, so um, in this case, Predictive Science Inc. Uh, in San Diego um, has been doing the simulation of how rapidly um, uh, fast moving particles come out from a flare uh, to the earth. That little, that little, um, um, beacon you see sort of coming from the sun to the earth illustrates light travel time. And uh, we're looking at a time, time sped up at four minutes per second. And so what you're seeing are uh, this proton intensity over on, on the right, you're actually seeing the, the scale bar of uh, essentially a, um, uh, a depiction of the radiation and how fast it travels. The, the highest energy particles are, are traveling at uh, about half the speed of light. 
And so if it's eight minutes from the sun to the earth, and when you see the, uh, the sun eight minutes ago, it's just like, uh, and these particles are traveling at half that speed, and sort of four minutes later, we're, we're going to be um, uh, receiving some of those, those particles. So uh, in this particular visualization, it's, it's illustrating the, uh, um, the nature of open space being able to, um, uh, to illustrate uh, um, you know, these, these time variant phenomena and really look at these simulations in detail. And, and so uh, we want that interactivity um, both for showing that data. We also want, uh, I'm sorry that the video that I tried to show of the process with glue did not come across uh, too well. But that, that shows uh, astronomers using tools that they want, that they're comfortable using and bringing that data into, um, into our digital universe as an overlay and really looking at filtering the data in glue and seeing instant results in open space. And that can be in a planetarium environment where uh, we had uh, for the Gaia data set, uh, this is Gaia data set is um, the Jackie's been focused on that. And we were able to, uh, we had an audience of about 200 scientists that came together for the Center for um, uh, Computational Astrophysics in New York, which is a new center, new science center. And uh, so we filled the dome with the astronomers. Uh, we were looking at uh, this data back and forth um, so this is very exciting insofar as the ability to look at, at that latest science, put it into open space, and that open space can be shown in a flat screen like this, or it can be shown in stereo for VR, it can be shown in a planetarium. So it has this ability um, uh, to really um, show a tremendous amount of content, relevant content to scientists, um, but also the dynamics, like I just briefly showed the, a, a few clips of, of, the, uh, of the material that we're working on for um, uh, this, this uh, presentation that we're going to be giving about uh, NASA's um, uh, work with, with, with radiation coming from the sun um, and also the concern for how to protect astronauts uh, because that's that's a, a, a big deal and so far as going beyond the Earth's magnetosphere and uh, getting out, uh, in, you know, out of its protective cover. Thank you. This is all very inter interesting and uh, exciting to see. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we also have a few questions, uh, three actually. Sure. So, okay. Kun, Kun Kuyke, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thank you for this uh, very flashy presentation. Um, I was wondering also on time evolution, can, how, how feasible is it to, for example, zoom out and then travel in time and watch the Magellanic Clouds go around the galaxy or watch M30? Well, if we have a data set for that, um, that's entirely possible. Um, and uh, one, one data set, um, uh, it's uh, been embargoed uh, uh, right now, but uh, with the OSIRIS-REx mission, uh, we visualize uh, that. I didn't actually show any of our... our um, our mission visualizations, such as uh, uh, we visualize uh, missions run by NASA's navigational system called SPICE, computational system, it uses their large ephemeris generator, so we know exactly where things are, and, and so they do for mission planning as well as visualizing the mission after the results come in. But we can show where the camera's looking, and we can actually take the image result and project it to the target. Um, in the case of OSIRIS-REx, we were doing that and uh, at a conference, uh, we saw that uh, they actually have trajectories for the uh, uh, bits of, of uh, asteroid Bennu that are falling off. And so we have orbits for all of that. So you have the operations of, of this uh, mission, OSIRIS-REx, which has gone to asteroid Bennu, and uh, it needs to come in and, and actually get a, a sample. It needs to touch down and grab samples at the same time it has to figure out where is the, these potential hazards of this material, which is spinning around this, this low mass asteroid. So um, in the same way um, for dynamical um, uh, uh, calculations of the Magellanic clouds, um, we could put that in. If, if we have that data set, we, we'd be able to put it in for sure. Would be cool. Thank you, Kuhn. We also have a question from Alexander Kshulevsky. Would you like to ask your question? Yep. 
Uh, thanks, Marlies. Uh, very nice presentation. I had some experience in the past with uh, open space, and I tried to import uh, magnetospheric models of the Earth uh, and also uh, real uh, data measurements from satellite swarms uh, belonging to NASA and ESA. Mm -hmm. And the process was very tedious, and also importing yeah. catalogs can be very tedious. And I'm very sorry you didn't manage to show this gluing part of your presentation. Has that uh, advanced? And also, uh, how easy is now to install open space on Linux? Because that was also, I mean, I managed it, but it was, it required some work. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking that. So, um, yes, we are multiple operating systems. It's being developed within Windows. So there's, that's just sort of your best fit, perhaps. Uh, we also have a Mac version. And, uh, but generally, it's uh, our developers, which are few, um, are mastering in uh, Windows and then uh, also doing a version for Mac. But for Linux, uh, we require that you actually compile it yourself. Um, and so uh, also this um, difficulty in putting the data in, uh, this, this, is, this is one of the things that does excite us about glue. Now, um, what I had intended to show in this video is really um, uh, an edit down from uh, about a 20 minute video from my colleague, Jackie, and meant for her students. It was kind of an introduction. It seems we have a, an internet problem for, for a moment. But it pulls the sheets on uh, they, uh, one plot and see the, see the results in, in three, 3D. Um, my internet says it's slow. I'm not sure if I'm speaking too fast or slow. Um, but uh, we also, I should mention, if you download open space, our website, I uh, didn't even uh, put that up here, but is open space project, one word, open space project. Dot com. We're really a dot org, but it's a dot com. And um, there on that website, uh, we have uh, basically a portal into our wiki and to our GitHub. Uh, also, our academic papers, which are, are really um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the basis of all of this uh, and the academic work that, uh, thanks to working, with universities, and, and then we're an academic uh, uh, museum as well, is that those papers are all published there. So about like our dynamic scene graph, uh, how we do the atmospheres, uh, the various components of open space, the globe browsing like you're seeing uh, in Tell with Mars are all in there. We have a Slack channel as well, and it's an active Slack channel um, that, that our developers are on that. And a number of uh, our user base is growing, but it's not tremendously huge. So it doesn't overwhelm the capabilities of our um, developers being on that uh, Slack channel to help you out. So that's um, that's another uh, important feature I I find for um, uh, users such as yourself that site. This was difficult to do. We need guidance on this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank I'll you. definitely check it again because it seems there has been some progress and I have gotten a message in the chat that actually uh, there is work being uh, going on on the data abstraction layer to make it easier to import data. So this is very good. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, so that is uh, the last question for now in view of the time. Um, and thank you again, Carter, for this uh, uh, inspiration. Well, thank you. And I, I'm sorry if my style of jumping around is a little crazy, but uh, I, I did want to uh, just, um, I, I, I'm sorry that the movie about glue didn't quite work, but I, I, I think you all uh, get the idea, get the picture of what open space, as Anders pointed out, is, is such a, a large concept, um, but that we want to make it useful for the sci scientists as well. Um, not just the educational demonstrator. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you.